Good evening, Commissioners. I'm Scott Robinson, and I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Portland Public Schools. I'm pleased to be here this evening to share with you one of the many positive outcomes that can be attributed to the degree of collaboration resulting from proactive regulatory oversight and local control of the cable franchise. As a K-12 public school system in Oregon, we, like most school systems, are seriously challenged to provide modern technology services in support of our educational mission. We have many aging buildings, we have declining funding, and provision of those kinds of technology services to our student populations is extremely difficult. And as a service provider within K-12, we strive to stretch our meager resources through leveraging partnerships with both private and public entities. The most recent example of that was with the City of Portland and the Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission. The thoughtful leadership and local regulatory oversight of the Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission over cable franchise rights yielded the development of the institutional network, or INET. The INET provides connectivity, network connectivity, to over 100 Portland public school buildings, and through a collaborative endeavor of the City of Portland's Ernie Network, created an opportunity to access high-speed bandwidth at an affordable price. This opportunity was created through the stewardship of the MHCRC in creating a franchise fee structure which allowed use of public right-of-ways for for-profit enterprises while creating a much-needed fund to reinvest in public purposes such as ours. Through the MHCRC-guided interconnection of the INET and Ernie networks, Portland Public Schools has been able to reduce bandwidth costs from $180 per megabit to just over $5 per megabit. As, an import, as important, the total bandwidth to each school has moved from 1.5 megabits per second to 100 megabits per second. Without this dramatic reduction in price and increase in speed, high bandwidth would not have been affordable and the services that we need to provide would not have been capable of being provided. Provisioning this type of high-speed bandwidth is essential to core curriculum tools that drive modern schools, including high-speed internet access for research, distance learning opportunities to connect to the rest of the world, stream digital content, and online collaboration tools, including voice-supported applications. Without the regulatory oversight and the franchise management of the MHCRC locally, we would not have been able to access these services through our existing cable provider. Janassi. I'm an independent film and video producer, Rainbow Video and Film Productions. I'm based here in Portland, Oregon. One of the main reasons I chose my profession is because of the importance I attach to a diversity of voices and the free exchange of ideas heard in the United States. During the years I've worked in this field, many, many produ mainly producing documentaries for PBS affiliates, I've noticed a great deal of change in this particular area. Many PBS affiliates, starved of funding, have turned more and more to funding from corporate sources. Corporate funding changes programming to meet corporate demands. Now it is more difficult to distribute programming that is critical of corporate interests. Our voices as independent producers, once guaranteed a platform on PBS, now are heard less and less. Most importantly, the idea that the airwaves are a public resource is fading away. We are more and more accustomed to commercial interests in conflict with public interest guiding programming decisions. We find it harder and harder to produce and distribute programming critical of corporations and government. Names like Viacom, Time Warner, Walt Disney, Vivendi Universal, General Electric, all major media owners also reflect strong political and commercial views. Relaxing rules governing monopoly ownership of our media is a nail in the coffin of democracy's most essential ingredient, the free exchange of views and information. American cultural, socioeconomic, and political diversity will gradually be more influenced by corporate values. Those of us who value the rich brew of different ideas and cultures in this country are appalled to see the erosion of another public resource, our airwaves. Please do not loosen regulation of the ownership of our media. We are talking about nothing less than how we communicate with each other. We cannot afford to lose our freedom to learn and openly exchange views to narrow commercial and government interests. Thank you. Thank you.
Good evening. My name is Rosie Stevens. For the past four years, I have served on the Board of Directors for the League of Women Voters of the United States. The mission of the League of Women Voters is to encourage the informed and active participation of citizens in their government. In order to become informed, we must have the right information regarding issues facing us and the views of the candidates that we will choose from. Two years ago, we succeeded in helping to pass a national campaign finance reform bill known as the McCain-Feingold Law. Sadly, provisions for reduced or free airtime for candidates on network television were removed from the final bill. As one of more than 60 organizations supporting the Our Democracy, Our Airwaves Act, we know the airwaves belong to us and not to the broadcast industry. Consider that to buy licenses to use a publicly owned spectrum, wireless phone companies have paid more than $37 billion into the public treasury. To operate on the publicly owned airwaves, broadcasters have paid zero. The reality is that the cost of campaigns is out of control. As the cost of advertising continues to grow, fewer individuals are able to raise funds necessary to run for office and get their message out. During the height of the 2000 primary election season, the typical local TV station provided 39 seconds a night of such discourse. The Our Democracy, Our Airwaves Act would, one, require broadcasters to do two hours a week, one in prime time, of debates, interviews, issue statements, and candidate profiles in the weeks leading up to an, organ, uh, to an election. They would give vouchers for free ads to qualifying candidates and parties. It would provide citizens with more information from the place where most voters turn, their television sets. Our research shows that the lack of information is a barrier to people who vote. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. I'm Sue Disciple, and I chair the Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission. Um, I want to emphasize the value and effectiveness of the framework established at the federal level that delegates regulatory authority to local communities. In exchange for the use of our rights of way here in our jurisdiction, we've been able to partner with the cable company to provide a range of services and benefits that are critical to our unique needs here in our community. And let me give you a couple of examples. We've established an institutional network that provides data, phone, and video services to 165 government, education, and cultural institutions in our community. As Scott Robinson just pointed out, this network saves our rural schools $100,000 a year in their telecommunications costs. And for both our urban and rural schools, it's increased bandwidth from 1.4 megabit service to 100 megabit service, 75 times the capacity that was formerly available and affordable for them. Using peg channels and franchise-related grant funds, we have developed a distance learning network that accounts for the majority of the enrollment increase in our community colleges. We've wired local nonprofit theaters and community centers so that public forums and local cultural events can be broadcast live, cablecast live on our channels. And we've enabled a regional network of shared programming for, of statewide import that helps us bridge the geographic barriers in our large state. But I'd also like to highlight our community's history in framing policy issues, such as our role in the open access debate in Oregon, where our rural communities still are not really served by the big telecommunications providers. Um, it was very apparent to us that there was value in a diverse and creative ISP environment. Um, we were able to frame that for the national debate. This kind of grassroots participation is essential and crucial into national policy making. And Commissioner Adelstein, as you pointed out, it's our communities, our economies, our citizens, our businesses 
who have something at stake, who are the winners or the losers in this environment. And thank you for being here and listening to our concerns. Thank you. I'm Tim Nesbitt, president of the FLCO in Oregon, and I'm here to uh, echo some of the testimony you heard uh, from S Sister Elder previously from, the, from CWA. Um, in particular, to express our concern on behalf of our 141,000 members in Oregon as workers and as consumers and as citizens, concern over the control of content in the media. When an executive of a Fox affiliate in Tampa can get away with a quote like, quote, the news is what we tell you it is, unquote. And when um, we see a growing practice among the major networks of denying access even for those willing to pay, when they deny ads which they uh, say are, quote, controversial issues of public importance. <laughs> we, don't, we don't want to see those policies applied at, at the local level as well. Secondly, consolidation of content is always uh, accompanied by consolidation of jobs. We've seen the loss of 70,000 media jobs in this country in the last three and a half years. And uh, again, as uh, S Sister Elder told you, when um, Com a Comcast executive talks trash about its union and its workers, it poisons the environment for workers' rights in all of our workplaces and communities. Finally, something new to look at, uh, if you can take the time in all, your in all of your deliberations, and that is that we have tax incentives in our tax code that actually encourage the uh, combination of companies. When uh, AOL uh, found it was sitting on an operating loss, it made it uh, advantageous for it to buy out, to, to en enter into the buyout of Time Warner. Why? Because there were great tax benefits that accrued to it. I think your policy should extend to a careful consideration of tax incentives we're providing that actually aid and abet the consolidation of our media. Thank you. So our pre-testimony, people followed the rules. Most people stayed within the two minutes. I only had to use that former legislative voice once or twice. And we're going to move right into you now, the audience who signed up. We're going to use the exact same format. I will be calling names. We'll have two line up over here, two over here, and we'll just keep going through that process until we get through, folks. We're doing great. People are staying on time, on message, fabulous. And so we're going to start with Collins Fellows and Kimmy Fuhrer over at this mic, and then we're going to ask Joseph Cotter and Stan Sanders to come to this mic. And the first person who gets to the mic wins. They get to be first. Ah, yeah, you're trying to slow down, aren't you? I see you. <laughs> Why don't you start, sir? Okay. Uh, my name is uh, Joseph Cotter. I, uh, I'm a mural artist. I'm a member of the Art Back Artist Cooperative out in Estacada and the Portland Mural Defense Fund in, in, uh, that's located in the city of Portland. Um, it might seem a stretch uh, as to why murals might be brought up in a, at a meeting like this, but uh, Portland is unique in a variety of ways, and one of the ways is that public art no longer exists in the city code. Public art is considered, uh, all public art are considered signs. And the reason for that is because uh, it's due to litigation that took place uh, with AK Media, a billboard company, now Clear Channel, uh, with the city of Portland about 1997-98. So the result of that was that all public art had to be folded in re into the sign code and regulated like signs. We've challenged that. We have a case sitting up at the appeals court right now trying to separate public art from signage. But what has happened is because of the rules in place to regulate signs, uh, including a large fee that you have to pay for, uh, to uh, get a, a, a certain size sign, uh, murals have to go through that same process. We don't have large fees. We don't make any money. We're trying, what we're trying to say in front of the court is that uh, signs can be separated. Revenue producing signs can be regulated differently from public art, and I'm not talking about just murals, I'm talking all public art, sculpture, two, three-dimensional, as well as uh, representational or abstract. Um, I don't know if there's anything you can do about it personally, but I just wanted to point out the effect that uh, a, a large mega corporation, media corporation, is having on free speech in the city of Portland, and uh, we're working hard 
uh, trying to work with the City Council, although their legislative options are constrained by the uh, court cases, and their largest significant interest right now is fear of litigation by uh, Clear Channel, and it, re and, it, and it restricts their ability to legislate properly so that we can have a, a public art operation going on here. Thank you for your time. Um, my name is Kim Foyer, and uh, I want to thank the commissioners, Mr. Copps and Mr. Edelstein, and also the panelists for uh, coming out here and uh, listening to some of our concerns. Uh, one of the things that uh, I'm concerned about is first, um, I'd like for, for us to kind of return to this fairness doctrine. Uh, I think there was uh, something that was kind of abandoned in the 80s, in the middle 80s. Um, the notion that uh, stations had to be fair and give both sides a chance. And what I've seen in you know, the broadcast television since it's been on uh, 50 years, I'm not that old, but uh, in the years that I've been watching broadcast TV, I don't think it's really, we can't really make these stations be fair. I think that we have to kind of abandon that and making rules saying that we have to, you know, make them give two hours every week or 39 seconds or whatever. I don't think that's going to work. I think the way we have to do is we have to reintroduce the, the concept, and, and I say reintroduce because I think everybody here, and I've said it many times, this notion of the public right of way. I mean, we have streets, you know, sure, it's private property, people own those, but you know, there's a public right of way where people can, you know, the public owns it. Anybody can walk on there, anybody can, can be there and uh, can have their, do whatever they want. And uh, this is the same thing, we own these airways, we own these bandwidths. And you know, the United States government has been, you know, letting people have licenses on them for the last 50 years. Uh, with really no compensation. And I think at this point, we have to set aside uh, a percentage of the broadcast frequencies for community access media. And we just have to say, well, listen, you know, the, the existing, you know, broadcast services, the commercial services are not doing the job. They haven't been, even within the mandates of their licenses. So let's take 10% or 5% and give it to, uh, you know, community access media. Thank and you. Then, thank you. Okay, thank you. I'd like to invite Stan Saunders, Neil Kerr, Phil Kane, and Mark Rapper. Oh, that's going to be an interesting one. Um, Robinowitz. Okay, excellent. To the up to uh, Mike Stans, yes. Thank you. Okay, sir, you may go. Commissioners, panelists, I'm Stan Saunders, uh, the old man of the Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission. I've been there too many years, I think. Uh, we can, as uh, uh, Councillor Stan uh, presented, we're the forerunner of must carry for uh, the FC, uh, the problem that came to the FCC, finally, and uh, many other problems in these 10 years that uh, we've confronted and uh, faced. The biggest problem that I've seen in these years, uh, we're faced by more and more giant rosebuds trying to keep the uh, magic word inactive, uh, which is competition. And we need competition, and the commission has done everything it can to provide that. Before the slight depression, or whatever you want to call it, we had three overbuilders coming into this area. And uh, financially, when, it, when the depression hit, they just had to drop out. So there's no competition at all. Uh, to, to deregulate a uh, company that has no competition and can do whatever it pleases, or mostly what it pleases, is uh, tragic, I think. So dig in, council commissioners. Uh, help us get competition back in the picture. Thank you. Sir? 
Hi, my name is Neil Kerr, and I'm a resident of Southeast Portland. Uh, I grew up in Portland, but I spent the 10 years following the fall of the Berlin Wall living in Prague. I saw the creation of the commercial media in Television Nova, which was largely funded by Ron Lauder of the Este Lauder family. Uh, he needed some place to sell his wares. But uh, the introduction of a commercial media was not necessarily a bad thing in the Czech Republic. Having had only one state media system, there was a pervasive mistrust of, of media because no one would believe what a monopolized media would say to them. Returning to my hometown, I find that the overwhelming consolidation of media means that we have a similar distrust in our media now. We don't, we don't trust them to say things because we think it represents one point of view. Uh, last night watching the news, I, I found no coverage of this event or any, uh, virtually any public policy. Instead, it was the usual coverage of sensationalized tragedy. Um, the only public policy was the paid, paid for by the campaigns of George Bush and John Kerry. Uh, doesn't the charter of the FCC call you to protect the community interest? Do you think uh, uh, the most important issue is whether an Irish rock star uses profanity? Uh, I, hope, I hope you'll protect uh, us from media consolidation and hopefully we'll roll it back. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Colin Fellows, a student here in Portland. Since the FCC was established, its charter aims included maximizing public interest and encouraging a diversity of voices so as to promote a vibrant democracy. A vibrant democracy depends on its citizens being able to make responsible and informed decisions. Today that diversity of voices is in the hands of a few giant corporations and the messages that we hear from radio, print, and television are in primary control of companies who are not dedicated media companies. They have their hands in a multitude of commercial interests, from theme parks and sports teams, sports arenas, interest in petroleum production, retail stores, book clubs, and even making engines for the military's tanks and airplanes. Profit might be the driving force in America, but it should not be the motivating factor in dissemination of information to the public. As fewer and fewer companies are able to control more and more of public's access to the media, the diversity of voices becomes harder and harder to hear. I encourage the FCC to honor its charge of diverse voices by supporting a truly local, independently owned services. The people here today represent a small part of that diversity of voices who have chosen not to be silent. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Mark Rabinowitz. I'm active with an internet media project called Deception Dollar, which has over four and a half million deception dollars in circulation to promote internet efforts that expose the 9-11 scandal, deceptiondollar.com. It is ironic that the internet, which was set up by the Pentagon, allows people to bypass media control and censorship. You can read the world press for virtually no fee. 20 years ago, Ben Bagdikian published a book called The Media Monopoly, which showed how there were only 50 companies controlling the media. We would sing celebration if that was the case today. Perhaps we could have a slogan, one man or one woman, one station. And while we wait and wait and wait for the government to remember there are antitrust laws in this country, don't give your money to media conglomerates that lie to us. The Oregonian, America Online, MSN, Fox News, all the rest. We need to repeal not just what's gone on recently, but the 1996 Telecommunication Act and the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And I have a specific question for the FCC. On September 11, the emergency communication response system was not activated in New York or Washington. If it had, especially the people who were in the second tower, a lot of lives could have been saved. And I'd be very curious why the FCC has not investigated the fact that the emergency broadcast system wasn't activated. Um, or, for that matter, why journalists in Iraq are being targeted by the military. Um, the media hold the fate of democracy in our hand. And as Mark Twain said, a newspaper is not just for reporting news. It is to get people mad enough to do something about it. Because the media controls what people are aware of 
and what the terms of permissible discourse are. And if we're going to take it back, we need to support independent media. We need to create our own media and stop paying attention to what Fox and the Oregonian tell us. Thank you. Thank you. If I could get Harry Lonsdale and Jean Carpenter to come and get in line, please. And those will be our last speakers until we take a break and we regroup after that. Thank you. Sir, your turn. My name is Phil Kane. I'm a communications engineer and a communications attorney. I've been in the field 50 years, including 28 years on the, on the FCC staff. I retired as the district director of the San Francisco field office nine years ago. This whole morass that we are all aware of concerning consolidation and its evils started in the mid 80s with the so-called deregulation when the commission threw up its hands and decided to turn the technical standards of broadcasting over to the industry. That's like letting the fox patrol the hen house. And the conclusion of that is that at the present time, and at least for the last 10 years, the commission has not had a compliance enforcement staff in the field offices to go around to each broadcaster and check both the technical and the non-technical compliance. It's done on a hit and miss basis and therefore the stations feel that they can get away with anything they can, especially since they're all owned by one or two major groups. Now, that may not be the total solution, but it's the start of the slippery slope. And the only thing I could say is to take that back to the eighth floor and pound the table and try to get the commission to be what it was as I remember it years ago, because in my early days, the commission was respected and looked up to by the industry. Now the industry blows the commission off and does whatever it wants. And the only thing I can say is that I'm retired and enjoying every moment of it because work was getting in the way of my hobbies. <laughs> If I could have Joe Yuris come to the other microphone on the other side, he'll be our last speaker before we break for our break. Harry Lonsdale, you got the mic. Thanks, Joanne. My name is Harry Lonsdale. I'm a private citizen from Sisters, Oregon. I want to thank the two commissioners for coming a long way to be here and listen to us today. I particularly want to thank you, Commissioners Copps and Edelstein, for, for leading the fight against media consolidation. You've been the leaders, and we're very grateful to you for that. It seems to me that the deal we struck 70 years ago when the Federal Communications Act was passed in 1934 was we grant free licenses to the broadcasters in exchange for public service. And I think everyone in the room agrees that the public service has dwindled in recent years to almost zero, particularly due to media consolidation, but just general the commercial, commercialization of the media. So I, I come to you with, with a question for your, for your opinion, frankly, and, and I want to lay the, the groundwork for the question. We here in Oregon have the initiative process. We can make our own laws. We can amend our constitution. And we're very proud of the, of the initiative process. We've used it more than any other state. We've passed more laws than any other state. So I ask you, can we use the initiative in Oregon to incentivize the broadcasters to give us free time on their stations? That is, could we impose a tax on all the broadcasters who broadcast from Oregon and forgive that tax for those broadcasters that supply us with free time? Now, I've tried this idea out on a number of people, including former Commissioner Nicholas Johnson from Iowa. His opinion was it won't work, that somehow the five commissioners, the five FCC commissioners, have more power. Just in fact, a majority of you have more power than the four million people of Oregon about what's broadcast in our state. So I ask for your opinion. Could we pass such a law, tax the broadcasters, forgive the, forgive the tax for those that provide free time? Uh, you've got two minutes, so. <laughs> I don't know I, if they I, can answer within you a, a lot of time. 
I think probably what Nicholas Johnson was getting at, and I, I don't know that I can give you a definitive answer, but I think what he's getting at is that do, you've got federal statutes uh, that, that primarily control uh, the FCC, the Telecommunications Act, and all, and I, I don't see that that would authorize uh, that kind of a state initiative. But you know, this whole thing, and I, and I really would like some not to prolong, uh, go beyond your uh, uh, time here, but several people have raised tonight this idea of either taxing the uh, industry or, or assessing some kind of a spectrum fee. And it sounds, I think, at first glance like, uh, like a good idea. A lot of people pay for rights for the spectrum. Why do we give the broadcasters uh, all this free spectrum? But I, I really think, and again, I don't know the answer, but I think we need to ask ourselves, is that really the way that we want to go? And is that the way to make those companies observe or uh, recognize their public interest responsibilities? And, and I think it's only one step if you go to a spectrum fee like that you almost propertize the, uh, the spectrum, and, and uh, the next step is to say, well, why don't we let them pay a little bit more, and then they can get out of their public interest obligations entirely. And I don't know that that's a good idea. I don't know that we shouldn't want them to pay and find a way to make them pay for the use of the spectrum by observing specific public interest requirements. And maybe, uh, you know, some people implied that maybe we're beyond that and we can't get to that in this day and age, but I don't, I'm not ready to, uh, to go that far yet. I think we've got to engage this debate about the public interest responsibilities of broadcasters. It's certainly true. It's certainly true that most of the public interest protections that we had are gone, beginning as our friend from uh, the FCC said, uh, since the, uh, the mid-1980s. The, the vertical protections, the financial syndication rules, the control of content is gone, the horizontal protections are gone, the fairness doctrine is gone, uh, teeing up controversial issues is gone, requiring broadcasters to go out to their uh, listeners and viewers and ascertain what kind of programming they want. All that has been given away and it's terrible and, 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 and we continue down that road step by step. All of these public interest requirements have been, been eviscerated, but uh, we need to find a way to get them back. And I think with this kind of court decision and the kind of, the kind of attention we have on these issues right now, that maybe this is the moment to uh, uh, to go down that road and, and give that a good try, and, and maybe if that doesn't work, we ought to think about uh, spectrum fees and all. But I, I just I worry that there might be some unintended consequences of, of going down that road, and that maybe that's not the best way to get the kind of performance we ought to demand and we ought to expect from our broadcasters. But I'd love to hear. Uh, I mean, when we take a break, I'd love to hear the reaction of anybody in the audience to, to what they think. And we'll give Commissioner Alderstein an opportunity to respond when we come back, because we do need to break now. But there's a couple of things I want to tell you before you move. Freeze. <laughs> Don't move yet. A couple of things I want to tell you. You've got this salmon form in front of you. Yeah, I'm from Baltimore, so I said salmon, so, you know, okay, sue me. <laughs> uh, this form will help us in planning for future action. So it's really important that we get feedback from you and we know what you thought about tonight and you give us your ideas and suggestions. I also want to make sure because unfortunately my smiling face won't be here when you come back, but you'll have a fabulous moderator that will be here. And I want to tell you a little bit about her before you take break. And would you stand and smile please so they'll already know what you look like. And this is Regina Lawrence. She's an associate professor of political science at Hatfield School of Government at Portland State University. Regina Lawrence teaches courses in media and politics, public opinion, and public law. She holds a PhD in political science from the University of Washington and specializes in research analyzing media coverage of public policy issues. Dr. Lawrence is the author of The Politics of Force, Media and the Construction of Police Brutality, and has written articles analyzing media coverage of public health problems, welfare reform, shootings in public schools, and television coverage of the September 11th terrorist attack. She recently returned from a research fellowship at the Shorenstein Center on the Press, Politics, and Public Policy at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. So she's going to be a wonderful moderator. We appreciate her being here. You guys have been absolutely fabulous. Give yourselves a hand for being so wonderful and being so patient. And you are now officially on break. Thank you. Ten minutes. Ten minutes.
And in case you didn't hear, the salmon-colored forms that you have sitting on your chairs are very important uh, ways for the organizations here tonight to get information about you and to help you keep uh, in touch with their further efforts on media policy issues. So please do take a moment to fill those out. There's a drop box right by the door where you could drop them off. I'd like to welcome you all back for the second half of this evening's uh, program. And uh, especially, I, I feel the need to ask you to give yourselves a hand for being here and for participating in this very important event. And I also need to uh, thank the listeners on KBU and also our audience members who couldn't be here, who are not only listening on the radio but watching on cable access, brought to them by Portland Community Media. Uh, and I also need to do one little piece of business before we begin our second half of our program. Uh, Joanne Bowman, as you know, is our moderator for the first half of the program, and one of the problems with going first is that there's nobody to sing her praises, and so I'd like to take a moment to thank her for her participation, many of you. Many of you are aware of uh, Joanne's outstanding leadership skills and her, uh, her record of public service. Uh, she continues her community involvement in a variety of ways. In fact, I have to read from the list because it's so long. She's now vice chair of the African American Chamber of Commerce, co-chair of Portland's Office of Neighborhood Involvement's Public Involvement Task Force. She's a member of the governor's Racial and Ethnic Health Task Force, and she serves on the boards of Metropolitan Family Services and the Coalition for a Liv Livable Future. So we thank her very much for her, uh, her, the part that she played this evening. What I'd like to do is uh, explain to you quickly the format. We are going to have a, a group of panelists, as you see. I'll quickly tell you their names and what they're going to talk about. Then I'll read you a little bit about their uh, biographies. Uh, just as with the first half of the program, they will each uh, give their uh, comments. And uh, there'll be opportunity then a little later in the second half for public testimony. And uh, what we do need to do is to conclude the public testimony, at least this part of it, by about 9.45. But we do have a long list of you who would like to testify. So I'd like to reassure you that even though we do need to conclude and allow the commissioners to make some summa summation comments, there will be opportunity for you, uh, everybody who is on the list, uh, to testify as well. So after those summation comments, if there are still names on the list that we haven't gotten to, we will get to you at that time. So without further ado, uh, let me tell you about our panelists this evening. Uh, first, Elsie Hansen, who's the uh, uh, member of the board of KBU FM Radio, who will speak about keeping the community in community radio. Michael Brown, who is president of Brown Broadcast Services, will speak on low power FM radio. Kurt Henninger, who is Senior Vice President and General Manager for Oregon and Southwest Washington for Comcast, will speak on supporting localism and diversity uh, and on the community level. David Olson is Executive Director of the Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission. He will speak on local community benefits derived from the ability of local governments to regulate cable companies for their use of public resources, the public right of way. And finally, Nigel Ballard, who is wireless director for Matrix, Matrix Networks, will speak on the importance to the community of access to Wi-Fi and broadband technologies. Let me just tell you a little bit about this uh, excellent group of panelists that we have. Elsie Hansen has been an active volunteer at KBU Community Radio since 1978. She serves on the board of directors, personnel committee, and as a folk music DJ. Her day job is as president of the National Association of Letter Carriers, Branch 82. She has volunteered for a number of nonprofit causes for many years in Portland. Michael Brown has more than 30 years of professional experience in radio broadcast engineering. Michael Brown is president and owner of Portland's Brown, Bro Brown Broadcast Services, which focuses on strategies to maximize radio station coverage. Brown has traveled extensively to observe how community radio stations interact with their audiences. He serves on the Low Power FM Advisory Board of the National Federation of Community Broadcasters, and he is president of the Northwest Community Radio Project. He lives with his activist wife and his lazy cat in Portland. 
Kurt Henninger oversees Comcast's three lines of business in video, high-speed data, and voice services, leading nearly 1,400 employees in Oregon and Southwest Washington. Prior to joining Comcast, Henninger held sales and marketing posts in several related com consumer e electronics companies. Since moving to Oregon in 2000, Henninger has joined the boards of the Oregon Museum of Science and Technology, the Oregon Cable and Telecommunications Association, and the Portland Business Alliance. Since 1983, David Olson has served as director of the Office of Cable Communications and Franchise Management for the City of Portland, where he counts among his duties staffing the Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission. In 1998, Olson authored the nation's first cable open access provision to address the emerging issue of how cable operators might gain an uncompetitive advantage as they began to provide internet access. Olson also serves as adjunct faculty at Lewis and Clark's Northwestern School of Law. And finally, Nigel Ballard draws upon 15 years of experience in the wireless area, from consulting through to designing and implementing wireless solutions. He steers Matrix Network's efforts to install wireless at schools, marinas hotels, golf courses, enterprise and secure locations. An in-demand speaker in the wireless world, he has served as the European editor for Penn Computing Magazine. In his free time, Ballard works to bring high-speed wireless access to underserved communities, advising Oregon's nonprofit Personal Telco Project, and recently joining the City of Portland's Wi-Fi Steering Committee. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. Hi. This is the KBU testimony and first, I'd like the commissioners to know that there are four large, non-commercial Portland FM stations. We have uh, metro-wide signals for all four. There's a big one. The big one is Oregon Public Broadcasting. It's unusually successful because it competes in drive time for the number one spot and produces a half-hour local news show Monday through Friday. We have a a college-based jazz station, an excellent one, and we have something originating out of the public schools that is a classical station, and then there's KBU. It's such an honor to have bragging rights over KBU here tonight, and thanks. Uh, I want to read you KBU's programming charter. We're 35 years old. We're unusually successful as a community station. And I offer this to you as an example of a charter that would be helpful. KBU shall be a model of programming filling needs that other media do not, providing programming to diverse communities and unserved or underserved groups. KBU shall provide access and training to those communities. KBU's news and public affairs programming shall place an emphasis on providing a forum for unpopular, controversial, or neglected perspectives on important local, national, international issues reflecting KBU's values of peace, justice, democracy, human rights, multiculturalism, environmentalism, freedom of expression, and social change. KBU's arts, cultural, and music programming shall cover a wide spectrum of expression from traditional to experimental and reflect the diverse cultures we serve. KBU shall strive for spontaneity and programming excellence, both in content and technique. At any given time, KBU has about 100 DJs, three or 400 volunteers, and 6,000 members who own the station. We own a small building, we broadcast 24-7. And in our small way, we are successful at that. Uh, we are, in fact, proud that we are not stuck in the LA airport. We are broadcasting this live. <laughs> so here's a story about localism. And that localism is really our best thing. Um, we have many hours of public affairs programming each morning, weekdays. It's called the Radio Zine, and a wonderful host, Lisa Loving, was interviewing uh, two African-American musicians, David Parks and Daryl Grant. They created a 
a local project to mentor youth, kids at risk. They were going to teach them technical music producing skills and rapping and singing and hip hop songs. They got the kids organized, give a performance, and then afterwards they had a daytime ice cream social. Okay. Now, while they were uh, interviewed on the radio while they were talking, they said they were musing about could there be developed a Northwest version of hip hop? Just as there's an East Coast and a West Coast, maybe they can, there would be something distinctive that would rise up out of this project and these would be the future leaders of Northwest hip hop. I don't know if the distinctive part, and this is a joke, would include the ice cream. But I am confident that there will be no commercial station nurturing that growth. None. Right. To support a policy or a concept of localism uh, through regulatory policy, I think we need to understand why as a, as a nation that that has value. We may presuppose that there's an inherent value in programming local public affairs because the local community gets a calendar of events and um, opportunity to react to regional in issues of importance. She put that one minute sign up on me, it scared me to death. Okay, but it's true for art as well. Um, the fictional melting pot did not create Harlem jazz. It didn't develop Nashville country, and the reason that it's called surfer dude music is because in Southern California they've got an ocean. I submit to you there is no huge national outcry of desire for Harlem surfer dude jazz twang banjo music. <laughs> Although Kabu would probably play it. <laughs> Localism. Localism has created masterpieces of American culture. Radio can nurture that if it's programmed locally. National programming can't come close. It just takes the spice and vitality and variety out of the local cooking. Localism must be enforced by articulated specific policies that measure a station's success objectively and numerically. Okay? It should not be possible to get a license renewed without an open annual meeting and reports detailing a required number of local factors, such as the number of local PSAs played during the prime time hours for free. Inclusion of true diversity should get a station positive ratings for renewal. If it isn't measured, it won't get done. Finally, the hot button issue of fines for obscenity that is substituting for the real systemic problem of gross sensationalism of commer commercial radio. It's ridiculous, it is arbitrary to set fines equally for all sizes of organizations. Fines should be set in percentages of the revenue of the station. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise small stations are disproportionately at risk. One song mistakenly play played by one of our volunteer DJs could have enough bad words, each an individual violation, to completely bankrupt our station. Now, in contrast and in closing, right here in Portland, on a morning drive time radio show, a commercial host DJ played a recording of the dying screams of Nicholas Berg in Iraq while he was being beheaded. They played it in drive time, right? What happened? The DJs were fired. That's what happened. This is the most obscene thing I have ever heard being broadcast. Where there should be a policy for the FCC to investigate that kind of stuff if we're truly going to protect our children. And all of that should happen long before my baby, little, life-loving, all-inclusive, eclectic station is threatened for playing one song that we forgot to do the one bleep. And with that, I'll turn it over to my fellow panelists and thank you for listening. That's great. Hi, I'm Michael Brown. I'm a owner of uh, Brown Broadcast Services. I'm a radio engineer. My primary business been at it for 30 years, he is doing FM studies, preparing FCC applications, building stations, and my dream is to have a station the quality of KBOO in every community in the country. Yeah, we often forget how lucky we are to have a station like this. In fact, we need several stations like this in every city, and most, most areas don't have it, and there isn't much space left on the dial. 
And a good thing that was done a few years ago was the establishment of low power FM radio. These are 100 watt non-commercial community stations that by definition have to be locally owned and operated. And I'll primarily be talking about that. There's good news and bad news on the low power FM front and I'll talk specifically about the Portland metro area in that regard too. The good news is that there are now over 700 LPFM stations either on the air or will soon be on the air nationwide. There are 27 LPFM construction permits, that's a permit to build the station, approved in the state of Oregon. Several are on the air and there will be perhaps 20 or so more on the way. They're serving their communities well. They're not causing interference with, quote, aviation cellular phones or emergency services, as the managers of uh, Portland's Clear Channel Station Group said might happen when they commented on LPFM back in 98. In fact, I've personally yet to see any LPFM station running over power, badly overmodulating, or somehow using unapproved homebrew tr transmitters, or for that matter, doing anything else illegal that might have a significant potential for interference. Indeed, I find that these stations are concerned and afraid of having an FCC inspection and are ill-equipped to pay any fines. In essence, they're scared straight, and for the most part, they're following the straight and narrow. But there is a lot of bad news in LPFM, and hopefully you here in this room can help us on this. The approval process has moved very slowly. Some of the applicants have now been waiting over four years. Many of them are giving up hope. Some of them are even dying off while the process continues to grind on. Now, we recognize that there is not enough staff at the FCC, but when there are scarce resources, you set priorities. Putting more staff at the FCC into services that promote localism, such as low power FM, needs to be a top priority. So I call upon the commission to finish the job and get LPFM stations on the air. The other bad news, and hopefully we can change this, is there are very few, very few LPFMs in the major cities and urban areas like Portland. The Radio Preservation Act of 2000, if you recall, imposed, in fact, forced the FCC against their better wishes, a third adjacent channel interference protections on low power FM. This effectively eliminated nearly all the urban LPFM channels. There has been a technical study which was mandated by that legislation. That study is now complete and it shows what we've known all along, that any areas of interference from an LPFM station three channels away from another local station is minimal at most and that uh, there are existing rules already on the books if there are problems to mitigate those problems. There is now a Senate bill that has been introduced by Senators McCain and Leahy. It's now got a number, Senate Bill 2505. Everyone in this room, please call your senators and tell them to vote for Senate Bill 2505. The next thing is even with the passage of the Senate bill, we've still got a problem. There may not be very many urban F LPFM channels because last year there was a translator filing window. These rebroadcast other stations. They're 250 watt, up to 250 watt signals. And they bring signals, in many cases, from thousands of miles away. There were 13,000 translator applications filed in last year's window. There were many legitimate applications, many of which I prepared, <laughs> but an awful lot of spam. In fact, 5,000 of these applications were filed by just three organizations. I did a study of the impact on the Portland urbanized area, which includes Vancouver. It showed that there were eight possible LPFM stations in the Portland metro area if third adjacent protections are repealed by Congress and if the 2003 translators were ignored. But with these translators, there would be only two possible LPFMs, both on the same frequency at opposite ends of the metro area. In other words, the new translators have eliminated 75% of the opportunities for low power FMs in Portland. This is very typical of cities of this size around the country. Also, new full power stations and move-ins from outlying areas are threatening low power FMs and for that matter, grandfathered 10 watt class D stations. Reed College has a radio station, many of you may know, and it was threatened by move-ins. Fortunately, it survived for now. So I have several policy changes, which I'm running out of time and I'll try to go over here, that I'm recommending to the commission. Some of these can be done 
uh, just by policy changes, some of them will require a rulemaking to change the rules. I asked the Commission to consider as soon as Congress repeals the third adjacent ban, which we expect that they will, we should schedule a new LPFM filing window. We should allow new LPFMs to displace any existing or proposed translator as long as a new frequency can be found for that translator. Everybody wins in that scenario. I also would like to see LPFMs filed in this upcoming window to be able to displace 2,003 translators whose main studio is out of state and more than about 300 miles away, irregardless of the availability of a new translator channel. So this would preserve new translators that are proposed last year that are truly part of a local, regional, or statewide network such as OPB. I would ask the Commission to show some regulatory flexibility for LPFMs and grandfather class Ds when they're displaced, allowing them to go as close as second adjacent to local stations as long as there is no population in the zone of interference and therefore no real impact. I would also ask them to allow LPFMs to use directional antennas, which they're prohibited from doing now, to avoid interference allow them to move their transmitter sites up to 10 kilometers. Some LPFMs are dying because they currently can't move them more than 1.2 miles away from the current site, even if they are displaced. I'd like to allow LPFMs to make minor changes in frequency during the application phase. These are all flexibilities that every other class of FM station and translators now enjoy. LPFMs are really in a straitjacket, and as a result, a lot of them are dying unnecessarily. And I would finally ask that uh, we consider to allow LPFMs to have the same rules as translators for adjacent signals. This would be great if this could happen. Translators cover, in many cases, five times the area of a low-power FM, and yet they're allowed to be second adjacent or third adjacent to local other signals as long as no one lives in the protected or the uh, predicted area of interference. I did calculations on some uh, hypothetical Portland area low power FMs, the radius of interference, of possible interference, is 100 feet or less in almost every case. So I'm running out of time. I'm just going to finally say that I'd like to see the Commission overall, for all stations, update their methodology for predicting coverage and interference. And with that, I'll close. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Kurt Henninger. I'm the Senior Vice President and General Manager of Comcast in Oregon and Southwest Washington. On behalf of Comcast, I want to tell you that we're very proud to be your cable company and proud of what's been accomplished in our community since we brought the local team here together in the year 2000. The FCC's recent report to Congress on video competition stated the vast majority of Americans enjoy more choice, more programming, and more services than any time in history. I'm proud to say that Comcast has been a positive force both nationally and locally in creating more choice for consumers. The report also found that people in every community in America have a choice of at least three distributors of multi-channel video programming, a cable operator and two nationwide satellite providers, and some communities have more. Portland is an excellent example of this highly competitive landscape. Our competitors, Dish Network and DirecTV, are very aggressive. These companies have gained significant market share in the area served by our operation. Competition is also robust for internet services. The pile of promotional CDs that I receive weekly from various internet providers is evidence of this competition. Internet service is available from dozens of companies offering a wide variety of service and pricing options. The local phone companies have also recently increased the competitive pressure in the high-speed internet services market with very aggressive promotion of DSL service. Since 2000, in Oregon and Southwest Washington alone, Comcast has invested more than $500 million of at-risk capital to maintain, expand, and improve our cable infrastructure. This investment has led to the enhancements of our current products and the delivery of exciting new products for our customers. As examples, last year we brought high-speed internet service through cable modems to 100% of our local service area when we completed our rebuild. 
In February of this year, we doubled the download speed of the internet product from one and a half megabits per second to three megabits per second without a change in price. We were among the first in the country to offer an integrated home networking product, which, which makes it easy for our customers to share their broadband connection wirelessly among the multiple PCs in their homes. Last fall, we rolled out the most robust high-definition TV lineup available in Oregon and Southwest Washington. In November, we were the first Comcast market in the country to offer the cable card solution that replaces a set-top box with a PC card that plugs into a new generation of televisions. We're also giving our customers increased control of their TV viewing and their time by delivering one of our most exciting new services that we call On Demand. Digital cable customers in Portland Metro and Clark County, Washington have access to more than 1,500 hours of stored video content and they can watch it when they want with more than 70% of that content included with the digital package that they already purchase. Improvements in our local operation have not only been focused on new products and product enhancements, we also recognize that customer service is an area where we needed to improve. Customer service improvement is a major company-wide focus for Comcast, and Comcast has developed and implemented a new customer first initiative. Each month, an independent company surveys hundreds of our local customers who then rate us on key areas of satisfaction. We're also handling more customer calls with local employees than ever before. In fact, in 2003, we added an additional 40,000 square feet and more than 100 new customer service jobs to our local customer care operation in Beaverton. Locally, we now employ more than 1,500 people. In sharp contrast to our aggressive satellite competitors, we contribute to our local communities through the collection of franchise and peg fees, which add a significant delta to what we charge our customers versus our satellite competition. Since the year 2000, Comcast has provided our local communities $72 million, $56 million in franchise fees, and $16 million in peg fees. We also have constructed and maintained the municipal institutional networks for many of the uh, communities that we serve. We understand the importance of providing an outlet for local voices that are addressing local interests, and to that end, we're developing programming partnerships with local radio and TV stations. We insert local news into CNN headline news with segments from KGW in Portland and KVAL in Eugene. We carry OPB signal overnight after they shut down their over-the-air transmitter and we provide very localized weather information through WeatherScan Local. In the past year, we've added Telemundo along with 23 other Spanish language uh, digital networks. We've added Chinese, Filipino, and Russian networks. We added BYU TV and the Catholic network EWTN. This was in direct response to the diverse interests of our customers. Additionally, we provide eight access channels for education and public use to advance free speech in our area. In our community, we are contributing to local schools, volunteering with local nonprofits, and doing this at the same time that we're bringing new and exciting services. This year alone, we will provide more than $400,000 cash and $600,000 of free advertising to local nonprofit organizations in our community. Tonight, you've given me the opportunity to do something that I love to do, which is to tell you a little bit about the dedication to our customers and our communities. I feel this spirit's reflected in the daily efforts of our more than 1,500 employees, and on behalf of them, I'd like to say thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. <clears throat> Commissioners, uh, I'm David Olson from the uh, City of Portland Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission. Uh, I certainly on behalf of the city, the commission, the community, just thank you so much for just being here. In uh, 21 years of doing this, there's only two places I could ever find an FCC commissioner. One was inside the Beltway, by arrangement, and the other was at uh, large industry conventions primarily in Las Vegas and New Orleans. And 
the fact that you're here and you've been doing these on your own time and in many instances uh, out of your own pocket shows a dedication to public service that I think is phenomenal. You have, however, arrived at a, uh, in a maverick state and a maverick community, as you <laughs> may well know. Uh, yeah, Oregon, Oregon uh, takes some pride in that, uh, both uh, the education and the quirkiness. Uh, the story uh, does go that uh, on the Oregon Trail, the Continental Divide, uh, there were two signs. Uh, one sign said, to Oregon, and the other sign was a pile of uh, quartz, fool's gold, that indicated where to go to the California gold fields. And all the people who could read came to Oregon. <laughs> uh, so we do have a history of valuing education here. Um, it is a quirky state. Uh, it's the only state uh, in the union where you can take your own life, but you can't pump your own gas. <laughs> It is also, and I want this to be well understood, the home of cable television. The first transmission of cable television in the United States occurred on Thanksgiving Day, 1948, in Astoria, Oregon, atop Coxcomb Hill, where the Astoria column is. There are some apostates who say this occurred in Pennsylvania, but we know they lie. <laughs> and all red-blooded Oregonians know different. So I want to assure you of that. We're also uh, in a community that values uh, land use planning. As you heard, public broadcasting is uh, the highest rated drive time radio station. Um, every single foot, every inch of the Oregon coast is open to the public and owned by the public. We're the first state where every piece of litter that went out from a bottling company came back with a deposit requirement. So everything they sent out had to come back. We only wish that could happen in some media. <laughs> We're, of course, the, home, the original home of the writing, production, and, uh, and uh, uh, broadcast of Louie Louie. Let's be clear about that. And uh, finally, in in honor, I think, of the uh, Third Circuit decision today and the FCC's ownership rules, that most recent development I referred to is, is true. The FCC ownership rules also had a right to die, and we appreciate that it happened when you arrived today. <laughs> I do cable for, uh, as a regulator for a living. Uh, I can't now ever work in the private sector again. And um, it is similar in many ways to what you, uh, what you do. And in our case, however, uh, you work in an area where the public owns the airwaves. And public, the public interest must be served. I work in an area where the public owns the right of way and the public interest must be served. And we are not different in what we're seeking. We are not. I think we're very fortunate. I particularly, I, I want to thank Kurt Henninger from Comcast as the only member of a large media corporation who, who was brave enough, who cared enough to show up tonight and speak to us. I can decry Comcast's percentage of ownership in the media, but I cannot decry how local governments and cable operators have worked together to serve the, to serve the public interest in a way no other media does in this country. And the, the PEG Access Studios, the, the institutional network serving the schools, the percentage of revenues devoted to the public interest in franchise and peg fees represent dollars that stay in this community and are not sent 
to bondholders and debt holders elsewhere. They are stay and are reinvested here. And no other media can say that. Uh, we learned early on that the angel of public interest doesn't descend on couch potatoes. <laughs> you have to step up proactively and engage it. It won't just come down on you as you sit with your TiVo. <laughs> you have to step up and seek it. You have to send chocolates and flowers and cards and engage. And it won't just automatically show up. And cable is a perfect, perfect example of that. Uh, many of these provisions we have in the franchises, the PEG access, the INETs, they don't automatically happen. They have to be triggered by a community that's proactive. You have to step up and negotiate them. You have to want them, and you have to have a community that supports them. Uh, we've done that, but it isn't automatic. It takes a, a community of concern and a willing uh, operator to negotiate these things and make them happen. We are proud to have created this, so much of the alternative uh, media venues here by working with the authority, such as it was that we had, and by negotiating that with the operator, which I used to call the operator of the week, but uh, which we're happy actually to have Comcast come to town because their core business was cable, which was not true of the prior operator. So cable, of course, grew up in an environment where there was no reference in the Communications Act for many years. So it grew up as a relationship between the guy in the pickup with the wires and the city hall. And they worked things out. And uh, the FCC had a very limited uh, involvement in it over the years uh, until the 84 Cable Act, which really enshrined this principle of federal local. It's the only medium where that happens to that extent. And despite that being enshrined in statute, as we know, uh, we can still be cut off at the knees. And we can be and, and have been. And the law of intended and unintended consequences is as easy as the stroke of a pen at the FCC. When, when uh, the FCC decided, in its infinite wisdom, tentatively decided that uh, cable modem service, broadband cable, was an information service, it essentially wiped out uh, and has taken away uh, what uh, very shortly could amount to, to 40% of the revenue of the fees that went to PEG access and uh, to uh, franchise fees here locally in the community with a stroke of a pen. And, um, and that uh, broadband internet at the same time, which we fought very hard, as you've heard here today, to say we have to have open access. We have to have multiple providers. We had ISPs in the dial-up world. We can't have a duopoly gatekeeper over the broadband world that is going to be the only realistic internet for everybody. In the, in the next few years. We, we lost in the Ninth Circuit, but we're hanging on by our fingernails in the Brand X case with that telecommunications component. And we hope to God that uh, Congress and the FCC wakes up and says, no, it's not good for the gatekeepers of the internet to be the incumbent phone and cable company. It's not good for everybody. So I wanted to say, we're very happy you're here. We're, we're happy about what we've been able to do here with our facilities. You may not know, we have community access channels under, under, with the same channel number, common channel lineups across the whole metro area and multiple cable franchises. Why? Because we cared enough to do it and work it out with the operator. We learned about access in part from the FCC's rules in the 1970s. Remember, local programming and access were pioneered by the FCC in the 70s. Uh, and they suggested that cable systems should have local programming, there should be access. Now you were taken out jurisdictionally of access, but you had those local programming rules in the 70s. Those two were taken out. I remember coming to a very different FCC in the 1980s under Mark Fowler, and uh, it was told by staff that nobody cared about PEG access anymore, and nobody cared at all, and that uh, uh, the FCC didn't want to have any more involvement, and uh, and I, I thought of uh, the Greek myth of Saturn eating its children, but I'm glad that at least the messages went out earlier and we took it up with a vengeance at the local level. So 
I want to conclude with just a couple of thoughts. I mentioned the gates of the internet should not be a duopoly. I mentioned the angel of public interest has to be pursued proactively, and I'm glad to see two commissioners on the FCC doing that. And I would mention that monopolies, and this is the ownership rules, are so much easier to prevent than to undo. And I thank both of you for being here. Thank you. Good evening. I, I was asked to stand up. I'm apparently too short for the camera to see me, whichever camera it is. Anyway, my name is Nigel Ballard. Uh, I'll try and be uh, short but sweet. The uh, last speaker of the night is always uh, a bit trepidatious. I expected uh, two, uh, <laughs> two, uh, two old ladies knitting noisily in the front row. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's a testament to the spirit of uh, Portland slash Oregon, the fact that there's so many damn people here right to the bitter end, so uh, good for you. The, uh, yeah. the, uh, now, the subject is media. Uh, I'm going to take a slightly different tack. Uh, my area of uh, interest and possibly expertise is wireless, and wireless is a, another way to deliver media of one sort or another. I've actually written a, a speech, which is fairly unusual for me. I normally ad hoc it, but here we go anyway. so. Uh, uh, Portland has the, the dubious distinction of excelling in a number of distinct areas. We have higher unemployment than anywhere else in the USA. Yes, we do. All that free time uh, allows Oregonians to enjoy more retail book space, <laughs> strip clubs, it's a, it's a fact, and restaurants per capita than any other US state. But there's something else we have more of than anyone else. It's not rain. It's access to free Wi-Fi. And uh, as much as I beat the Wi-Fi drum, I'm sure there's 50% of the people here who have no idea what that stands for. <laughs> it's a good uh, late night exercise. Could we have hands up anyone who knows what Wi-Fi is? OK, apparently I'm wrong. OK. <laughs> the, uh, damn, we're so educated here in Oregon. OK. Uh, I've written down what it is. So for the one hand that didn't go up, I'll just do it really quickly. Uh, it's a global license-free wireless standard that allows computers with a $40 wireless card to surf the internet without the needs for traditional wired connections. So this particular convention center has Wi-Fi throughout, so you can just wander around with a laptop. Uh, now, Portland has over 130 deliberately free and open wireless access points, and uh, everyone is invited to connect to them and go anywhere on the net. There's no cost, there's no restriction, there's no advertising, and there's no tracking of who you are and where you go. Yeah, that's worth a clap. Yeah. Damn straight. The, uh, this truly is a free lunch uh, made possible by the support of local businesses, and I'd like to thank them, uh, and for the volunteers of the Oregon nonprofit group called the Personal Telco Group and uh, I count myself as, as one of their members. And uh, if you want to find out what exactly this Brit up here is talking about, and you have access to the internet, then you go www.personaltelco.net, and you can read all about us and uh, discover where all this wonderful free internet is. So what does this mean to the residents and visitors uh, of our fair city? Well, it means the ability to access the vast and constantly updated knowledge bank that is the internet. And better still, they need make no financial commitment or undertaking for access, which Personal Telco sees as more of a right than a privilege. Um, there's something very gratifying for me anyway on a personal level, watching people sat on the steps of Pioneer Courthouse Square on a sunny day, emailing loved ones, instant messaging remote friends, job searching, or just reading online newspapers. And on a sunny day, you go there and you'll see six, eight, ten people, and they're using a Personal Telco node it's not costing them anything, and uh, actually the, uh, a local Portland institution sponsors it, and their name has completely gone out of my head. Uh, damn. Uh, they used to be the, uh, help me out, who is it? Uh, they changed their name. It's another one of those quirky things. It's Portland Business Alliance. Thank you, Sam. Uh, the Portland Business Alliance. Uh, they used to have another name, but, but they changed it. Uh, 
Anyway, the, uh, if we work to ensure that everyone has equal access to information and new sources from the far left to the far right, the more educated and the more informed Portland has become, and that has to be good for the uh, prosperity and social development of the state. In Portland, we're generally very well read, and that's evidenced by the entire city block that the PALS takes up, and uh, we're very proud that we have that. Uh, but even with our apparent thirst for knowledge and escapism, we remain vigilant to the fact that remote forces are working behind the scenes using their corporately controlled print media, billboards, and radio stations to feed us an approved diet of news and views. I think we know who we're talking about. With our increasingly easy access to the internet, thanks to all this free wireless access we have around Portland, we are at least empowered to seek the views of anyone who cares to put up a web page. And that's pretty important. And surely this has to be better than the daily diet served up by a single corporation hell-bent on omnipresence. And that's really what we're talking about here tonight, omnipresence, some, some uh, remote CEO in a glass tower on the, uh, on the East Coast deciding, well, I think this is the, the, the pop group that's going to be the next, uh, the next hit. Uh, this is the billboard that everyone's going to be looking at as they drive to work. This is what they're going to read. And they're now, uh, I understand, they're now taking over Spanish speaking as well. So, uh, yeah, omnipresence, it's, uh, it's a scary word used in that context. Anyway, the internet really does want to be free, and, uh, and I urge you all to, uh, to grab your wireless cards and go out and surf the web and read the far left and the far right and get somewhere down the middle, and then you really know what's going on. I thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you again to our panelists. I think our commissioners might like to make some comment in response, and then we'll begin the testimony. I just wanted to say there sure are some good things happening here in Portland, and we heard about a lot of them from this panelist, from KBU to, uh, to, to the Wi-Fi networks, to the excellent um, franchise authority that, and, and the good work that the cable regulatory agency is doing here. It makes me think about the comment that one of the citizens, Mr. Lonsdale, I believe was his name, made at the end of the last session where he asked, why can't the state of Oregon take it upon itself to put a requirement on these broadcasters to give something back, maybe to give a percentage of free time to candidates or else pay a tax? And the response was, well, it's really a federal issue. It's our responsibility. I noticed that uh, uh, David Olson said, well, we have very similar roles, which is that we both try to take a public resource, in my case right away, in your case it's the spectrum, and take something back for the public in exchange for it. The difference I might note, just to add to that, is that you actually do something with it and we at the FCC don't. <laughs> you know, you get something good out of it for your community and it, with the cooperation of Comcast, and we do thank Comcast for being here, you have an excellent PEG system. And I notice here we are getting live gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage and I don't necessarily see the broadcast commercial folks back there doing any, any filming. Uh, so what comes back to us for the free use of the spectrum by the broadcasters? And why is it that localities can do that, that they can take something back, that they can take a percentage and make sure something comes back to the community in the form of access, and the FCC for the whole nation can completely, utterly fail to do so, and can allow broadcasters to take this incredible resource and make literally billions upon billions of dollars and give virtually nothing back in the form of access to the public, to their own airwaves, and maybe there's a model there that we at the FCC can take, and maybe we can learn something here from what you're doing in Portland and what the Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission is doing. And maybe we could take that lesson and say, maybe the FCC ought to do something along those lines with the vast spectrum resources and give a percentage back. And here's our opportunity to do it. The transition to digital television. This is the time when they're taking an incredibly valuable resource that Congress gave them. Some people estimate it's worth up to $70 billion just handed to them. Maybe it's worth less than that, maybe more. But we so far haven't asked them to do anything in return. Can they give just a little bit back to the public? Can they give some access to the public in exchange? Can we use something along the lines of the model that you're doing here uh, with the Mount Hood Regulatory Commission to do that? I don't know if any of you have any comments on that, but I just wanted to make that observation. Because I think you're doing a great job here in so many ways, and, and we need to take that back to Washington. Uh, 
reemphasize what Commissioner Adelstein said about getting these public interest obligations of the DTV broadcasters decided pretty quickly, because I can tell you one thing, if the broadcasters get the rights to must carry for all of these digital streams on cable, and we haven't got this worked out, then you're never going to have public interest uh, obligations for DTV broadcasters. So that's why we have to bring this home, uh, home soon. I really appreciated all the comments on uh, low power. I think, as I said uh, earlier, this can be such a boon to uh, localism and diversity, and I think you present some very real uh, challenges for the FCC to slog its way through these issues with the translators and so forth. I enjoyed the conversation or the uh, presentations on cable. You know, your favorite regulatory commission in Washington has been so back and forth on cable over the years. First we regulate, then we deregulate, then we regulate, then we, we deregulate. Right now we're, we're in a hands-off uh, mode by and large. But uh, you're so right that uh, a properly motivated uh, locale or region can do so much if you have uh, uh, franchise authorities that are willing to do it. And as you said, you've got to have the community behind it, and you uh, and you really do here. Uh, and that's good. The final comment would be on the uh, internet, and I agree that uh, the internet wants to be free, but I don't think that's any guarantee that the internet is going to be free. And I think it's really going to take a lot of work. You know, when we had the broadcast, uh, the, the three broadcast networks back and not so many years ago, everybody said, well, cable will be wonderful competition for this. This will guarantee localism and diversity. Uh, but lo and behold, now 90% of the major cable uh, uh, outfits are, are owned by the same people that, that own the broadcast networks. So then more recently we hear, well, don't worry because we have the Internet. And it's so open and it's so dynamic and so liberating and free. We went, uh, my staff and I, and looked at the top 20 uh, news sites on the internet. Guess who owns them? It's the, it's the very same uh, people. And I really am worried about this, uh, this question of access. And, and you're so right with regard to the uh, uh, decision on, on cable modem and the tentative uh, decision on, on wireline. These are, are really uh, dangerous decisions. And, uh, uh, and we need to... Uh, I guess what we really need to do is delay for a while at the commission and make sure they don't do any more harm until hopefully a better day arrives.